Hello, I'm Tony Perkins, President of the Family Research Council here in Washington, D.C. Behind me is the National Archives Building, home of the Declaration of Independence, the document that started our journey as a nation. Its closing words are profound. We pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. Tonight, we're not asking you to pledge your life, your fortune, or your honor, but I am asking you to make a pledge. Let me explain. I came to the Family Research Council after having served as a state legislator in my home state of Louisiana. As one who has worn the uniform of a United States Marine and a police officer, but most importantly, I'm a husband and now father of five children, I came here to help Christians influence this city that was once dominated by Christian influence. As I travel, I hear the questions Christians are asking. Is there hope for America? Are we too far gone? Can we really change the direction of our country? Trust me, as long as there is a God in heaven, there is hope here on earth. The real question is, will we do our part to influence America? And that is exactly what I Pledge Sunday is all about. It's a call to Bible-believing Christians across America to faith, family, and freedom. Many Christians today don't understand the foundational role that Christianity and the Bible have played in America's success. It is an incredible story. But it's now missing from public school textbooks, and sadly, it's missing from many church pulpits. If more of us understood the connection between our faith and our freedom, we would not so easily cast biblical principles aside when choosing our leaders or even passing legislation or educating our children. We now see the results of ignoring these biblical principles. We ignored biblical principles on economics, and now we have almost $16 trillion in debt. We ignored biblical principles about the family, and then divorce, abortion, and the redefinition of marriage became more and more acceptable. We ignore biblical principles about God-given rights, and our first freedom, religious liberty, becomes expendable. I Pledge Sunday is about changing that. I Pledge Sunday is a call back to faith, family, and freedom. So let's get started. I'm going to turn things over now to my good friend, Dr. Mark Harris, standing by live at First Baptist Church in Charlotte, North Carolina. Pastor Mark, you get us started in the call to faith, family, and freedom. Well, thank you, Tony. We are excited to welcome you into the sanctuary of First Baptist Church, Charlotte, North Carolina, and literally all around the country, more than 2,500 churches and small groups are gathering together, and we want to welcome you. In fact, why don't you reach out and give all of those folks that are joining us here a warm First Baptist welcome, would you? Right here into our sanctuary on this incredible, incredible night. We are excited that you are here, and indeed, indeed this very evening, we are reminded that our faith, our family, and our freedom bring us here to this place. This is a service. It's not a rally. It's not a political rally, but rather it's a time for us to let God speak to our hearts and for our hearts to be challenged. You know, there have been other times in our world's history that there were days similar to maybe what we're facing today. In fact, I'm always reminded of the day in which Nehemiah lived. In fact, the gates and the walls around that city of Jerusalem had been destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. And you'll recall that as they came in and destroyed those city gates and destroyed those walls, that for 140 years, that thieves and invaders were allowed to come in and to rape and to pillage the land. And it was in that day that God moved in the heart of a man named Nehemiah. And as God moved in the heart of this faithful man of God, he went to that city of Jerusalem and he walked around those walls and he wept as God broke his heart. But he also wept as God gave him a vision. In Nehemiah chapter 2, it says, Nehemiah himself speaking says, Then I said to them, You see the distress that we are in, how Jerusalem lies waste and its gates are burned with fire. Come and let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer be a reproach. And I told them of the hand of my God, which had been good upon me, and also of the king's words that he had spoken to me. So they said, let us rise up and build. And then they set their hands to this good work. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe tonight that believers all across our nation are gathering in homes and in churches just like you're gathering here because we recognize that our day 
is very similar to the crisis that Nehemiah found. You see, Nehemiah, when God gave him the vision of how things would change, the first thing he told them is, we need to recognize the emergency that we're living in. And ladies and gentlemen, that's exactly where we are tonight. And it's a time that we recognize that we're living in a day where there is an attack on the sanctity of life and an attack on the sanctity of marriage and an attack on religious liberty and at a time where we are seeing the immorality of a national deficit that continues to be left on the backs of our children and our grandchildren. You see, we need to recognize the emergency. But Nehemiah also led them to understand that it wasn't going to be himself that would change it. And we understand that it's not going to be just a change in politics that's going to make the difference. But God said that he was the one on whom they could trust. And Nehemiah said, I told them of the hand of my God, which was good upon me. And that's why tonight we're joining our hearts together to seek his face and to seek his leadership and to seek his guidance to guide our nation. But then finally, I love the part where the people recognized and they looked at Nehemiah and they said, let us rise up and build. And the Bible says they set their hands to this good work. Not only did they recognize the emergency and determine they were going to rely on God's power, but they were relentless in their efforts to see things change. You see, I'm reminded in the day in which we live of a quote from Charles Finney, who was an incredible noted preacher and evangelist during a great awakening that took place in this country. And I want you to hear these words even as we begin this meeting tonight. He said, and I quote, the church must take right ground in regard to politics. The time has come that Christians must vote for honest men and take consistent ground in politics. Christians have been exceedingly guilty in this matter, Charles Finney wrote. But the time has come when they must act differently in this matter. God cannot sustain this free and blessed country which we love and pray for unless the church will take right ground it seems sometimes Finney wrote as if the foundations of our nation are becoming rotten and Christians seem to act as if they think God does not see what they do in politics but I tell you he concludes he does see it and he will bless or curse this nation according to the course Christians take in politics, end quote. Charles Finney, noted preacher, leader of the great awakening that swept this nation. Would you join me as we begin this night relying on God's power and going into his presence and asking him to meet with us here? And from your homes and from your churches, would you join with us in prayer? as we go to the Father in these moments. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, this night we have come together because we believe in you. We've come together because we recognize that faith, family, and freedom find their foundation in you, our living God our Heavenly Father, the author and the finisher of our faith. Oh God, tonight as we are gathering all across this nation, we pray that you would meet with us, that you would speak through every speaker, that you would encourage the hearts of your people across this country to hear, even as Tony Perkins moments ago reminded us, that we must be committed, we must be willing to pledge. We live in such a day where the call for Christian citizenship has never been needed more. And I pray that even tonight here from Charlotte, North Carolina, and all across this nation, that you would begin to rekindle fires of revival that would move in the hearts of your people and that we would recognize the emergency we live in, that we would rely upon your power and your power alone, and that, God, we would join hands and lock arms and stand for truth. 
And that tonight, each of us, before this night is through, would say, I pledge to stand as a citizen of this nation and be heard. Father, grant it to be so. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Nothing like bones to remind you of your heritage. The set of ideas that is being implemented and advanced in this capital at this time is terribly frightening to people who are students of history. the Roman Empire, the parallels to what is going on in America are absolutely frightening. And the question is, are we going to go the right path ourselves, or are we going to continue down the wrong path that so many nations have fallen into? And save your soul, I can promise forever. Please welcome the producer of the feature film, Monumental, Kirk Cameron. It's a great honor to be here with you and all of you who are watching in your churches and in your homes uh, to be together with so many um, godly people, leaders. Uh, I'm here with my pastor, and uh, we are privileged to be a part of I Pledge Sunday. Uh, thank you all for joining us. I made a, a documentary this last year, which was uh, really a new foray for me into the world of producing. Uh, I've never done this before, and it was quite a learning experience. I've been in films uh, where I've come at it as an actor, like in Fireproof or, or other types of films, but this was something I did because, well, it wasn't because I was a politician. Uh, I wasn't running for office. I, I didn't come at it as a producer. I'd never really done it before, or even as an actor, but as a father of six children. Uh, some of you may have seen Monumental. Um, this was something that really came out of my own concern for the world my six children are walking into. Let me back up for a moment and just tell you that I didn't come from a family of faith. I did not come from a political family. Uh, I can't remember my parents ever talking about voting or needing to vote. Uh, the subject didn't come up and we certainly didn't talk about God. Uh, I like to tell people today that I'm actually a recovering atheist. I lost my faith in atheism, and uh, I now love God with all my heart. And because of my love for my children, I want a great future for them. And when I look around, now that I'm, I'm paying attention as a father, I see that all signs are saying panic, aren't they? Uh, economically, we're $16 trillion in debt. Morally, it's frightening to see what happens. Just go down to our local public school or our mall and take a look and see if this is the direction we want our children to continue to go. Uh, spiritually, uh, the things that are happening uh, in our world and in our nation are devastating to stand by and watch. And so I turn on the news to try to figure out what can we do about this? What can I do about this as a father? And I find that Unfortunately, most people I see are, are play, playing the blame game. And I see the right blaming the left and the left blaming the right, the rich blaming the poor and the poor blaming the rich, government blaming uh, big business and businesses blaming the government. And then to top it off, uh, the church is blaming the media for the problems and Hollywood blames religion for all of the ills of the world. 
And I'm thinking, wait, I'm getting confused. I need to hear a clear voice that's going to direct us out of the wilderness to a place of blessing for our children and their future. Where do we find it? And I'm thinking, maybe it's simpler than all of this that I'm hearing. Perhaps we've simply forgotten what made us such a great nation in the first place. Could it be that simple? If only my name was Marty McFly and I had a DeLorean and I could go back in time and talk to the men and women who built our nation, perhaps they could tell us, here's what you're doing wrong, here's how you fix it. These are the non-negotiables. These are the essentials you must get back to. You've thrown them out. Of course you're having trouble. Well, I couldn't do that, so I did the next best thing. I bought a ticket to England, and I began spending two years retracing the escape route of the pilgrims, the brave men and women who understood the word of God enough to know that they needed to make a bold move. They saw their culture collapsing around them. Uh, the king had tripled the debt. He had enslaved his people. Uh, he had declared himself essentially God on earth. If, if ever there was a culture that looked bleak and dark, it was them. And they, before they were called pilgrims, were known as the separatists. They decided, instead of putting their head between their knees and getting ready for the end, they said, we're going to get off the defense, get on the offense, make a 500-year plan, and go build a new nation. And so I followed them out of England to Holland, where they stayed for 12 years under the care of their pastor, John Robinson. They uh, affectionately have now called him the founding father of the forefathers. And he taught his flock, his congregation there in Leiden, in Holland, the nation-building principles that came from the word of God that the pilgrims carried over with them on the Mayflower to the new world. And they began running those plays. They began laying down these principles. And they drafted up some amazing documents like the Mayflower Compact and making tr peace treaties with Native Americans and, and, and demonstrating Christian character that was just unheard of and was very fruitful, inspiring all those around them. I did this because I wanted to discover the secret sauce that made America so great in the first place. For so long, we've been so free and so blessed and so strong and secure. And I fear we're losing it quickly if we don't make a bold move today. And our forefathers had enough foresight to know that we would get off track because they knew the heart of man. Man comes with instructions. And we're told that by nature we will drift because we are bent towards selfishness and greed as human beings. That's why we need the Spirit of God to come. We need God to straighten us out and to turn our eyes to Him so we begin to love the things He loves and hate the things that He hates. And our forefathers left us a reset button, knowing we'd get off track so that we could return to original factory settings if that were ever to occur. And they left it for us in the form of the largest granite monument in the United States of America. And most people have never heard of it. Have you? It's 81 feet tall, 180 tons of granite, making it the largest solid granite monument in the United States of America. And it's sitting on top of a hill in Massachusetts. And most people have never heard of it. It's hidden behind a forest of trees in a residential area, uh, residential neighborhood. It's called the Monument to the Forefathers. Let me explain it to you. Her name is Faith. She stands 81 feet tall with her finger pointed to heaven. She has a star on her forehead representing wisdom, and in her left hand she's holding the Geneva Bible. That is the Bible the pilgrims brought over on the Mayflower. This is a copy of it right here, and her foot is propped up on Plymouth Rock. Under her was the expression of our forefathers' faith. They believed you must start, it must start with faith. And that expression would first be an internal transformation. 
It wouldn't be a top-down moralizing of people. It would be an internal transformation of the heart. And so below her platform is the first corner called morality. And morality is seated there with the Ten Commandments in one hand and the scroll of Revelation in the other hand. To her right is the prophet Moses holding the Ten Commandments, and to her left is etched in granite the evangelist penning the Gospels. This is the source of their morality, the Word of God and the Gospels. Then, once you had an internal transformation of the heart, you move to the left and you find law. Now, law is critical because to have civility in society, your morality, your good and evil, must be formalized into laws to protect the good and the innocent and to hold back the evil. And you will have society that is civil. And these laws were marked on the right by justice, and there was justice with the scales and the sword, indicating that the punishment must fit the crime. They must be fair laws. And on her left is mercy. And so you have justice and mercy giving a biblical view of law. And as the, the man law is opening the law book, his law book is directly under the higher law that is written in stone and can never be changed. So you would never have a law, according to the forefathers, that violated the Ten Commandments, that violated a law of God, the eternal rules of right. That's what kept us on track. And then finally, if you had civility in your society based on the right standard of morality, which was produced by faith in the true God and in his word, you were then able to educate your children. And education is seated at the third corner. And she's there with a wreath of victory around her head. She's holding tablets. And to her right is a mother educating her child. And it says youth, training up her youth in the way they should go. So that, as indicated on her left, when they are old, and there is a picture of an old man with a long gray beard holding the Ten Commandments in one hand and a globe in the other hand. I'm sorry, he's holding a Bible in one hand and, the, and a globe in the other hand, the world. And the Ten Commandments are at his feet. His name is Wisdom, so that when a child is trained up in the way he should go, when he's old, he'll not depart from it. And finally, the fourth corner is the, is the result of following this matrix of liberty, and you come to Liberty Man. And Liberty Man is there, a soldier, seated in his chair. The sword is put back in its sheath. He is done fighting. He has slain the beast of tyranny. And the, the lion's head is draped over his shoulder. And the skin is draped across his back. Tyranny, oppression, has been finished. And to his left is his wife. Her name is Peace. And she's holding a cornucopia overflowing with bounty and plenty and blessing. This is the strategy for building and maintaining a free and just society by our forefathers. We've got the strategy. We've got the playbook. We just need to go back to running them again. At the core, the spine of this monument is faith. One of our political parties right now is wondering if the name of God should be in the platform. According to our forefathers, God is the platform. When I think of how far our country has drifted, our forefathers would be rolling over in their graves to hear what we are discussing. The sanctity of life. Really? The definition of a marriage? Really? Religious freedom? Really? They would be appalled. I'd like to close with a quote from one of our founding fathers, 150 years after the forefathers. And while not all of our founding fathers were Bible-believing Christians, dedicated followers of Christ, most of them were, and were ministers, and held seminary degrees. Let me read this quote to you from one of our founding fathers. How has it happened, sir, that we have not 
till now once thought of humbly applying to the Father of Lights to illuminate our understandings. In the beginning of the contest with Great Britain, when we were sensible of danger, we had daily prayer in this room for the divine protection. Our prayers, sir, were heard, and they were graciously answered. I have lived, sir, a long time, and the longer I live, the more convincing proofs I see of this truth, that God governs in the affairs of men. And if a sparrow cannot fall to the ground without his notice, is it probable that an empire can rise without his aid? We have been assured, sir, in the sacred writings that except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. I firmly believe this. And I believe it too. Please pledge with us first to pray for this upcoming election. Secondly, to prepare by registering to vote and encouraging other people to do the same. Everyone you know, we've all got to get out there. And thirdly, to vote your conscience. Thank you very much. everyone it's great to be with you let me tell you I think that uh, Kirk has may have been painful but he's grown into this role quite well hasn't he <laughs> I, I want to say what what he has done in monumental is such a great reminder of why we are blessed as a nation and it reminds me of Abraham Lincoln back in 1863 at a time of great crisis in this nation. He called the nation to pray and to fast. And he said, Scripture attests and history records that blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Kirk, thank you for reminding America that we're blessed because we have said that God is the Lord of this nation. Our founders didn't forget that, and I'm grateful they didn't forget. And I want to encourage you, all of those that are watching tonight, to get a copy of Monumental. And I don't know about you, but our family has a Friday long-running tradition of pizza and a movie. And I can't think of anything better that goes with pizza than Monumental, right? Sounds good. Uh, sounds good, huh? The pizza or the movie? Both. Oh, okay. <laughs> Well, you can get a copy by going to ipledgetovote.org, and uh, you're going to hear a lot about that tonight. So all of you watching, uh, whether you're in churches, I hope you have a, a, a pen, paper to write with, because you're going to want to take some notes tonight. One website you are going to, one, you're, you are going to want to visit is I Pledge to Vote. I Pledge, the number two, vote.org. And on there, you will see a, a, a little uh, up at the top, you'll see where it says Resources. And you can go to that, click on, I'm sorry, click on tools, and then go to special partner resources, and you can order a copy of the movie Monumental. Now, one of the, the, the great truths that Monumental dis, helps us rediscover is that our founding fathers were committed to both God and to country, and they knew that the latter would fail without the former. Now, Dr. Harris prayed a few moments ago about pledging this night in our lives to the Lord, and I think as we begin the rest of this evening, it would be appropriate to continue this Sunday night service with churches gathered across the nation to stand together and pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. If you'll stand with me, and I'm going to ask for some help to do this. I think... Um, it would be good to have men representing one of the most effective organizations in America today that is equipping and encouraging young boys to honor both God and country. And they have a pledge, by the way. If you know the Boy Scout pledge, it is this. On my honor, I will do my best to do my duty to God and my country and obey the Scout law, to help other people at all times, to keep myself physically strong, mentally awake, and morally straight. Please welcome the Boy Scouts from Troop 94 as they come and lead us 
in our Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you, boys. We're going to turn it over to you to say the Pledge of Allegiance. Ready to lead us in our pledge? All right. Flag. Let's all pledge together. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Coming up on iPled Sunday, we'll hear from Senator Rick Santorum and Star Parker. The economy is in shambles. People are losing jobs. Money is inflating. Businesses are closing down. I have to live with my parents to make ends meet. I fear that everything we love and everything that we cherish, everything that we hold dear, all our freedoms, all our potential, is seriously in jeopardy. And it needs to stop. It needs to stop. It needs to stop. Yes, the spending frenzy in Washington needs to stop. We need to get government out of our business, out of our health care, and let bureaucrats know we don't want them to manage our lives. Prosperity does not come from expanding the reach and size of government, nor is it the product of the redistribution of wealth, but instead, it is the result of hardworking, personally responsible, creative, and free individuals. You know, we need to ask ourselves, where has out-of-control government spending taken us? The answer rests with you and with me. Our founding fathers rebelled against taxation without representation, but we don't have that problem. Men and women that we elect to public office, our representatives, determine the future of our nation. Our future and the future of our children and grandchildren is at stake. It's time to take responsibility for our future, the future of our children and the future of our neighbors. Pray, prepare, and participate. I'm only one person. One voice. One vote. I can't do everything. But I can do something. I can register. I can cast my vote. And I can make a difference. I'm Star Parker. For some reason, far too many Americans have accepted that economic issues are separate and apart from what we call social and moral issues. Issues like traditional marriage and abortion. However, the Lord of the universe never got this message. The Ten Commandments, in addition to addressing family and murder, address theft and covetousness. Central to a free society and a godly nation is a nation in which private property is respected, in which it is not permissible to steal. Central to socialism is the disregard of private property that government and politicians can decide what is right and fair and take from some and redistribute to others. Socialist societies are atheist societies. In a godly nation, not only do we respect our neighbor's property, but our interest in our neighbor is not out of envy of what they have, 
but reflects our love and concern for man made in the image of his creator. Socialism is a formula for economic failure. Capitalism, coupled with the love of God and respect for his commandments, is a formula for economic success. It is critical that the church community, the body of Christ, understands that the sanctity of private property is as sacred as the sanctity of life and marriage. Please welcome Senator Rick Santoro. Looking at all the numbers that um, are being thrown out in this, in these screens, the unemployment rate and poverty rates, um, and then listening to the, to the message about what we can do to solve it, I first want to stop and just say a prayer. I want to say a prayer and want us to think about those people behind those numbers. In politics, we think about numbers, but there are human beings who are not realizing their God-given potential. And so we ask God tonight, we ask God tonight to bless them, to bless the poor, the homeless, the hopeless, those who see so much prosperity and wonder why somehow they have not been blessed. Lord, we ask you to, to instill in all of us a sense of purpose and mission that we might strive to build a more just and better land so those without hope can have that hope. Those who do not see, can see. See your vision for them, see your plan for them, and realize that here in your blessed land. And we know how to do that. We know how to do that in America. We've been doing that in America better than any other country in the history of the world for 235 years. We have been providing hope we are the beacon of hope for the world. People come from all over the world, and even those who don't come are inspired by America. And what is America? Is America an ethnicity, or a race, a creed? It's the latter. It's not an ethnicity, it's not a race, but it is a creed. It's an ideal. Kirk laid that out ideal in his speech in the monument. The great gift that our founders gave us that is not being taught in America, it's not being shared with Americans today. They're being taught another creed. They're being taught another ideal, an ideal that is antithetical to the founders' idea. We are a divided country. No one likes to hear that. Someone who has served in public life doesn't like to say it. But it is the reality of America today. We are divided. And we have to understand what's at stake in this election. This is the most important election in our lifetime. Not just because of the economy. The economy is important. The economy is very important to people. We have to be able to feed and clothe and house and get to places. But America is more than stuff. Our founders said so in that founding document. When they talked about rights, 
unalienable rights, rights that can't be taken from you, given away, that are attached to us. Why? Because we are creatures of a loving God. And what were those rights? Life, liberty, freedom. To do what? To pursue happiness. And we think of happiness today and we think of, well, pleasure, enjoyment, things that make you feel good. That's what we're taught. That's what the popular culture teaches us. That's why you go to work, so you can have fun, you can enjoy, instead of work for the sense of work and serving God's will. But our founders understood better. And when they said pursuit of happiness, Go back and read the dictionary definition of happiness at the time of our founders. And what will you find? You will find that our founders understood, as the people at that time did, that true happiness comes from doing what you ought to do, doing what God has called you to do. And that's what they meant. To use the freedom God has given you to do what you ought to do to pursue God's will. And thus build a great and just society from the bottom up, to use your industry to build it from the bottom up. And we understood that the basic building block of that society, that economy, if you go look up the word economy, it comes from the Greek word oikos, which means family and household. The basis of the economy in this, not just this country, but in every country, is the family. It is the basic building block of our society. And when that building block is fractured, when that cornerstone is broken, or never even cemented into the building, the structure above it crumbles. And that's where we are in America today. The hopelessness that you're seeing, the want that you're seeing, yes, it's economic, but it's mostly because of the brokenness of the lives and the families and the communities. Because now 40% of our children are born out of wedlock, over well, now, roughly half of people over the age of 18 are married. That's down from 75% just 30 years ago. The family is coming apart, and it is no wonder the economy is crumbling. We cannot rebuild this economy and create opportunities for all, for those who are being left behind. Those left behind at the bottom of the income scale, those who are working in lower and middle income jobs. Do you know if you look at the income and you take the top 20% of those income earners in America, 85% of them are married. Less than 40% at the bottom are married. The people at the top don't preach what they practice, which is marriage, families, moms and dads raising children are at the heart of economic success in America. And unless we are willing to stand up from this pulpit and from pulpits around the country and from lectors at political debates around this country, and stand up for the family and for marriage, we will not have a society that is rich and prosperous on any level, much less economic. Our founders, as Tony quoted, mutually pledged to each other at the end of the Declaration of Independence. Mutually pledged to each other. See, that's how we do it in America. I'm sure we got some Marines out there. And when you're in the foxhole, you love your country. 
but you're mutually pledging to each other in that foxhole. Look at the people next to you, here in this room, listening across this country. Mutually pledge. Don't just say, I'll do it. Don't just say, I'll pray, I'll participate, I'll prepare. Don't just say it. Look at the person next to you. Pledge to each other before God that you will do what is necessary. At the turning point in American history, which is, in my opinion, this election, feel blessed because you are here at a time when your country needs you. God needs you. I pledge. I hope you do too. Thank you and God bless. Thank you, Senator Santorum. You know, without a question, as joblessness continues at record highs and economic recovery seems to evade us, Americans are focused on the economy. But, Senator, as you have pointed out, a nation cannot have a strong economy unless it has strong families. So I want to thank you for not being afraid to speak the truth, even to those who don't want to hear it. You know, some might be surprised to find out that the Bible has a lot to say about the economy and about money. In fact, Proverbs 22, 7 says, the borrower is servant to the lender. And that's a clear warning. And I'm sure that you are probably aware that this week, we, America, now has a national debt of over $16 trillion and counting. Now, a lot of that debt is to foreign nations, and being in debt to other nations makes it difficult, if not impossible, for America to lead internationally on issues such as religious freedom, on human trafficking, and working for peace around the globe. America's debt problem is a moral and a spiritual problem, and it's getting worse. And I'm not sure that we can work our way out of this on our own. This morning in my quiet time, I was reading an account of Jehoshaphat in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, and Judah found themselves surrounded with multiple threats and no way out. And this is what they said. We have no power against this great multitude that is coming against us, nor do we know what to do, but our eyes are upon you, speaking of God. If there was ever a time in this nation that our eyes needed to be upon God, it is now. And I want to challenge you to pledge to pray for this nation. I don't know if I mentioned it, but there's a website, ipledgetovote.org. If you didn't write that down until, until I see everybody writing it down across America, I'm going to keep repeating it, ipledgetovote.org. Go to ipledgetovote.org, click on Tools, and then Special Partner Resources, and there are several ministries that are calling Americans, and the church in particular, to pray coming up to this election. And we're partnering with them, and I hope you will too. And coming now to lead us in prayer is Ken Barron. He is the chief of staff to the president of Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, and he's going to come tonight and open us up in praying for our economy and for this election. Ken, thanks for being here. Thank you. It's certainly my pleasure to be here, Tony, among such a distinguished audience. Senator Santorum, thank you, Congressman. We're just uh, pleased to be here. Uh, I bring greetings on behalf of Billy Graham and Franklin Graham. Uh, Franklin couldn't be here tonight. He would have loved to. Mr. Graham would have loved to. Uh, but they did send their greetings. You'll see Franklin later on. Uh, Franklin, as you know, is one of the most outspoken people in this country and around the world on 
biblical values and virtues. And there could be nobody who will speak out more loudly in the Christian world than Franklin Graham. And I'm proud to serve him and to serve his father uh, very much. I'm also a completed Jew. So when I think about, and I was brought here as, you know, this is all God's work, this is all God's work, but I was called here tonight and to work for the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association in Charlotte because those of you in Charlotte know there's something very special going on in this city. There's something very special about to take places in our churches. And this election is a watershed moment for us to look and examine the values that we hold so dearly, not only in our Christian faith, but in this country. So I'm so proud to be here. And Tony, just thank you so much for having us here tonight to be able to pray. As a completed Jew, I also look at what was left out of a platform. Jerusalem. It breaks my heart. It breaks my heart that God who is the reason we're all here tonight. There's no other reason than God and Jerusalem. So I offer this prayer tonight on behalf of all of us at the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, Samaritan's Purse, and the Graham family. If we just bow our heads and pray, Lord, we just come before you tonight humbled by your mercy. Humbled by your love for us. And Lord, we know that we owe this all to you, nobody else. The economy, the, 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 the money, the things that we have been given, Lord, are all because of you. And Lord, as we put you farther away in our lives, out of our schools, out of our government, out of everything, we see those values diminish. We see the things that you've given us and we, Lord, we know that it's our job here tonight, those of us that you've called to be evangelists, those of us that you've called to be disciples, those of you, those of us who have been called to spread the word to others, are called tonight to reach out to our neighbors, to our friends, to our relatives, to all those that we hold near and dear, and those that we don't to ask them to come and make a decision. Take off the blinders as you took mine off to see the love of Jesus Christ. And Lord, we just pray tonight that what we talk about tonight will be done tonight and tomorrow and forevermore. And that we will find others, those that are like mine and those that are not like mine, that we can bring to know the love of Jesus Christ. We just offer this up in his mighty name. Amen. Next on I Pledge Sunday, Bishop Harry Jackson. <laughs> generation, we've neglected marriage, leaving it nearly defenseless to homosexual activists who are now trying to redefine marriage out of existence. Same-sex marriage, it contradicts God's will as revealed in the creative order. Violating God's law only brings pain and heartache. Right is called wrong, and evil is called good. It is because we have yielded moral authority to the demands of special interest or the ruling of some aberrant judge. And as a result, all of society suffers. The mother-father parenting arrangement is the one most conducive to the well-being of children, which is the key to a healthy and prosperous society.
The beginning of 2005, our son Jacob was going into kindergarten and he came home with a book entitled, Who's in a Family? And that introduces children to same-sex households. We realized that the intention of the administrators and teachers was to affirm these relationships and gay marriage in the minds of children. When we went into the school, what we requested is parental notification when these issues are brought up by adults within the school and the option to opt our child out of this type of indoctrination. She had checked with the administrators and, had, and they had said that this was not a parental notification issue. And I said, I'm prepared to sit here all night until I see some form of accommodation as a parent. The accommodation they gave was to put me in handcuffs and send me to jail. I couldn't believe that they were willing to arrest my husband. I just wanted parental notification. We want to raise our children to know God and to know his truth. I felt I didn't have a choice at that point in order to fulfill my role and duty as a father. Despite what the media would have you believe, this does not have to be America's future. The future of marriage is up to you. Your vote can determine the language of your state constitution and the people we elect in our representative form of government will pass the laws and appoint the judges who may decide the final outcome. Get involved. Vote your values, your biblical values, and make a difference. I'm only one person. One voice. One vote. I can do everything. But I can do something. I can register. I can cast my vote. And I can make a difference. Please welcome Bishop Harry Jackson. Greetings. Thank you very much. God bless you. Praise the Lord. Thank you. We want to give all the glory to the Lord. The topic is very simple. You see the issue. The redefinition of marriage has the greatest impact on the next generation, and we've got to work together to get it done. It's all about the next generation. There's so much that we could say, but I want to speak just for these few minutes to a special audience that may be listening via Christian television or may be listening to us by the radio. I want to speak specifically to the black and brown communities who may be listening. You will be the swing vote. For years, it's been said that Republican Party and uh, the white evangelicals have been all about righteousness issues. They haven't really cared much about the justice issues of the land, poverty, and all the issues that are so concerning many of the blacks. But the reality is that both righteousness and justice are in the Bible. But the foundation of the prosperity that we seek in our land is really based on biblical fidelity. We've got to understand if we sell out now as minority folk in this nation and bow our knee to Baal, then we lose it all. If God, if God, thank you very much, if God lifts his hand from America, we lose it all. If God decides as it was in the book of Joel, that he is not going to reign upon this land. Again, we lose it all. My black neighbor, my black friend, my Hispanic brother, my Hispanic friend, I want you to understand that you have got to vote your biblical values. You've got to decide that you're going to come off of a ideological plantation into the freedom of the liberty of the sons of God. You got to do it. You got to do it now. You've got to come out into freedom. It's a very difficult thing for some to hear. 
It's wonderful to think about the idea that we've got a first African-American president. And there, there are so many firsts that have gone on in our nation. But it's time for us to hear the voice of the master saying that I am a Christian first and foremost. Above all, I stand for, I live for, or I'll die for Christ and Christ alone. This is the call of this hour. This is a call to biblical fidelity. We've got to believe that somehow in God's economy, the reason that the pressure is so heavy on America right now economically is that we have not been biblically faithful. God's first. That's all right. Give the Lord a clap. God's first institution is marriage. And so if we turn against him on this situation, they, we then will fail. I don't have time tonight to go into the entire story, but we are going on a seven-state tour on critical swing states. We'll be coming back to North Carolina as well to talk to black, brown, white, and Asian pastors, encouraging them to encourage their people to vote. And we're going to vote our values and we're going to stand against these boxes that people try to push us in. We're going to have to break out of the Democratic box and break out of the Republican box and break into a new kind of political box. It's the Christian box. It's the kingdom box. It's God's agenda. It's God's way. I want to read you one verse of scripture before we close. Isaiah chapter 60, verse 1 is the cry that we must hear. It's the battle call we must hear. The verse says, Arise and shine, black America, brown America, white America, and Asian America in Christ, for your light has come and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. And it goes on to say in verse 2 that gross darkness covers the land. It has never been darker in recent history than it is right now in America. But I'm here to tell you that if we will guard the institution of marriage, if we will give ourselves to healing marriages on our watch, God will heal our nation, but we've got to do it now. There must be an urgency now. We can't wait for somebody else to do it. You and I have got to do it now, 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 now. Let God arise and his enemies be scattered. Let God arise and his enemies be scattered. How many of you right here in this great auditorium will stand with me just for a moment and shout out at the top of your lungs, let God arise in America. Let God arise in America and his enemies be scattered. Let God arise in America and his enemies be scattered. God bless you and may God be glorified in this great land he's given us. Thank you very much. One of these days, Bishop Jackson's going to get excited. <laughs> and boy, do I want to be there. Thank you, Bishop Jackson. I also want to thank him, not just for being here tonight, but Bishop Jackson and I go way back. We've done a lot together. And I just want to thank you, Bishop Jackson, for the work that you've been doing in calling pastors and churches to the battle to defend and to promote marriage. God bless you, and thank you for the stand that you're taking. You know, the, the media 
And many politicians would like us to believe that if you care about preserving and pr promoting traditional marriage, you're out of step with the mainstream. Well, folks, let me tell you, if you see marriage as the union of a man and a woman as being vital to the well-being of children, uh, to our society, and to our future, then actually you're in step with a clear majority of Americans. And you know that here in North Carolina, you voted 61% to support traditional marriage. Thank you, North Carolina. Thirty-two states have voted on the issue of marriage, and all 32 have decided to stand with God in his definition of marriage. And just in case you think something may have changed since May when you voted here as the last state, 30 states have constitutional amendments, two others voted on the issue, but a Zogby poll was released earlier this week that shows that the issue which has the largest percentage of agreement among likely voters is this, that the family is the basis of a strong community and culture. The ideal family is built around a stable marriage between a man and a woman. More than any other issue out there today, likely voters agree on that issue. You are not outside the mainstream. You are right down where most of Americans are today. Do not believe the media and do not believe the squishy politicians. Did I say squishy? <laughs> but let me tell you, having an opinion is not enough. You have to express it. And one way that here in America we express ourselves is at the ballot box. Marriage is an issue of national importance, but it also continues to be an issue in the states. In fact, four states will be voting on marriage this November. Maryland, Maine, Minnesota, and Washington State. Those states will be, decide whether they join the other 30 that have already passed marriage amendments, and we need to express our opinions at the ballot box. So those of you across this country, and those four states in particular, you need to make sure that you're registered and your voting. And so, let me mention a website where you can go to, ipledgetovote.org. And if you go to that website, click on Take Action, and then you can actually register to vote. In fact, I think we may do that right now. Let me, let's see if we can't pull this up here on the computer. Go to ipledgetovote.org. All right, we're, go down to Take action. Let's go take action. All right. Now we can look up to see whether we're registered to vote. Let me see. Let's try George. George. That's a good name. Uh, Washington. How about that one? <laughs> and then let's see. Mount Vernon. How about that? And then uh, Virginia. Let's try Virginia. Now, I know I'm from Louisiana, but I'm not encouraging the dead to vote, okay? So this is just for an example here. All right, now let's search to see if he's registered. Oh, he's not registered. He doesn't come from Chicago or Louisiana. Okay. But we can email him a form so he can register. So if you go on there, you can actually download the form, and I'm going to email him a form here. Let me put that in. FRC1, and I'm going to email it to George Washington at president. Let's try that. Let's see if he gets it. All right. And it'll send him a message to tell him that this election is important. If he's not registered, he can register. Let me send that. I'm not going to wait for the reply, though. So what you can do is you can send those messages to your friends as well. Check and see if two family members or friends, you can see if they're registered, and then send them an email right from that site 
and it will go to them where they can download the form, fill it out, and all of the information of where they need to mail it is right there. It's simple, it's easy, it can be done in five minutes, but five minutes can not only save you a lot of money, it can save the country. So make sure that you go to ipledgetovote.org. Well, still to come, James Robinson, Kristen Hawkins, Dr. Jim Garlow, New York City Councilman Fernando Cabrera, and Franklin Graham, still to come as we wrap up tonight's program. But coming now to lead us as we pray for marriage, for the nation, and for Christians to take serious their responsibility to be salt and light, even in the public arena, is my good friend, Dr. Rick Scarborough, who is calling the nation to prayer and leading up a national prayer effort. Pastor Rick, come and lead us in prayer. Thank you, Tony. I don't know if it's convenient for you. Many of you, it will be almost impossible. But we're talking about the foundation of our nation, apart from, from which we will not survive, the, the family, marriage. So, gentlemen especially, would you drop to a knee and let's go to the Lord in prayer and pray for this country and pray for marriage, shall we? And across uh, the listening audience and uh, those who are watching, join us in prayer. Father, in the name of your Son, Jesus, we bow before you troubled by what we see. Father, our heart is breaking because we see something precious being destroyed. Lord, there's a lie that has permeated our culture because it's shouted from the rooftops and advanced by so many and Father, I apologize that so many of my preacher brethren have been silent on the issue. We've been away without leave. We've been uh, talking about lesser things. But I ask you in Jesus' name to break our hearts, to, uh, Father, call us to understand the urgency uh, which was demonstrated in word and has been demonstrated by the life of Men like Bishop Jackson, men like the pastor of this church that led in the battle in North Carolina. Raise up sons of Issachar who understand the times and know what it is that Israel must do. Lord, let us be like the sons of Issachar. And I pray, Father, in the name of your son Jesus, that you might give us one more chance to get it right. Even as you gave this country a great awakening under the preaching of George Whitfield and Jonathan Edwards that gave birth to the courage to found the country, and then, Father, when we missed it on the issue of slavery, you moved through the preaching of, of, of uh, Charles Finney and a second great awakening. Lord, we're there again. We need a third great awakening. And so we ask it in Jesus' name that you would give us once again a renewal, an awakening, a third great awakening. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Coming up on iPled Sunday, James Robison, Kristen Hawkins, and Shirley Dobson. Over 1,200,000 unborn children are aborted every year. 22 out of every 100 children conceived will have their life ended by abortion. More than one out of every five. In 2008, the total number of abortions since the Roe v. Wade Supreme Court decision in 1973, 54 million. That's equivalent to the entire population of the states in the Pacific time zone. Can you imagine everyone gone? How many doctors, pastors, teachers, scientists, moms, and dads have we lost? What great discoveries and innovations will we never know because we as a society have called a child a choice rather than a cherished blessing from God? I'll never go to school. I'll never 
play sports. I'll never have a first kiss. I'll never be a father. I'll never get married. Abortion is a terrible thing. Our founding fathers understood that life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness are God-given inalienable rights. To ensure we did not lose those rights, they gave us a representative form of government that enables us to have a say in who makes our laws. On average, more than 50% of all registered voters don't vote. Does it really matter if we vote? Well, remember the 2000 presidential election? George Bush was declared the winner by a margin of just 547 individual votes. It does matter. You can make a difference if you vote. This year, 2012, could be the most important election year in the history of America. We must restore the right to life in America. But to do so, we must elect leaders who will enact laws that uphold biblical truth by protecting both the life of unborn children and the health of their mothers. Be a part of it. Vote. Vote your values, your biblical values. I'm James Robison, and Tony Perkins, I want to thank you for including me in the I Pledge Sunday. You know, I never dreamed, I imagine most of the people listening to me now never imagined that we would see what we're witnessing today, the disregard not only of God, God's standard and biblical truth, but the preciousness of life. Jesus said that as Christians, as believers, we are salt. One aspect and quality of salt is it protects the precious. Jesus says when we fail to be salt in the effective sense of the word, then it is good for nothing but to be trampled under the feet of men. We are witnessing today everything precious being mocked, scorned, and trampled under the feet of men. What could be more precious, more innocent, more worthy of protection than the unborn, totally innocent life in the womb with so much potential, so many possibilities? My story, a practical nurse, a hospice nurse, 40 years old, caring for an elderly man, found herself imposed upon by an alcoholic son of that elderly man. She was forced to have a sexual relationship. She conceived a child. Finding herself pregnant, she went to have an abortion. A doctor in Houston refused. Somehow he seemed to convince her that in her womb there were possibilities, and she reconsidered. My mother allowed me to be born, gave birth to me at age 41. I am the father of three, the grandfather of 11. We stopped counting after 20 million people who made professions of faith in Christ and tens of millions of people's lives have been saved around the world through our mission outreaches. Possibilities, my life. There are many people very grateful that a mother made a decision after facing a very difficult circumstance and she gave birth to me. And I've been able to point so many people around the world to life, preciousness, and protecting the innocent. Please welcome the Executive Director of Students for Life, Kristen Hawkins. You know, I've always said that my story really isn't that extraordinary. I've been a Christian my whole life. I was raised in a pro-life home. But I never really thought about abortion until I signed up to volunteer at a local pregnancy help center. I remember my first day clearly. I went into the center thinking I was there to answer the phones and to organize the diapers in the supply closet. I had no idea that I soon would be empowered, empowered to sit down and talk with women who were coming to the center believing that abortion was their only option, that I was going to be empowered to save a life. Ladies and gentlemen, I have something to admit to you tonight. I've been wrong. You see, my story, which is probably a lot like yours, is extraordinary. It's extraordinary because you and I were created by a God and chosen to live now in the United States of America in 2002, 2012. I forget my age. <laughs> he
He chose us, sinners, ordinary people, to take a stand and to do extraordinary life-saving works through him. Since 1973, over 54 million children have been killed by legal abortion in our country. Precious children who were created in God's image and who, just like you and I, are intrinsically valuable. Yet they were thrown in the trash because their mothers were deceived. Their mothers were deceived and told, you can't have that child and continue your education. You can't have that baby and continue to feed your other babies. You can't have that baby and stay with your boyfriend, your husband, whoever. And I know, 54 million is an impossible number to get your head around. That's more deaths than all casualties of war our nation has sustained, more deaths than any disease, more deaths than Middle Passage, more deaths than the Holocaust. But think of it a different way. In fact, if you were born after January 22nd, 1973, I want you to raise your hand right now. Congratulations. Those who have raised their hands are survivors of legal abortion in our lifetime. We survived, but a third of our generation did not. Our brothers, our sisters, our cousins, our best friends, our husbands and wives, they are missing today because of abortion. But brothers and sisters, there is reason for joy. And I hope you can see it. Because the tide is turning in our nation. More Americans now than ever understand that abortion kills a human being and is morally wrong. And despite the ruthless attack against life these past four years in Washington, D.C., momentum is on our side. And I believe God the creator of our universe, the master of all, has united us here tonight. He's united us, ordinary people, sinners. He's chosen us to be his hands and feet to abolish abortion in our lifetimes. But in order to fulfill this vision of abolishing abortion and living out God's will for us, there's two things we must do. We must pray and act guided by a courageous love. First, we must pray for those public officials who we elect and are about to elect. We must pray for those who are hurting and work actively against us every day. We must pray for the pre-born, their mothers and their fathers and those women who've already chosen abortion. And finally, we must pray to our God and ask him where we need to engage in this epic battle. And then after we've prayed, living courageous love, we must act. We must register to vote and make sure we know when we need to vote and where we need to vote. And then we need to go to every single person sitting in our pews, in our workplace, who we know is a Christian, is pro-life, and make sure they're registered to vote. And they understand they can't waste their vote this November. We have to get out on the streets, and we have to go door to door and talk to our neighbors and friends about abortion. And finally, on November 6th, we've got to get out and vote. And if you can, Take the day off work and drive everybody you know who's pro-life to the polls. As Tony mentioned, in 2000, in 2000, the choice between a pro-life and a radical pro-abortion presidency came down to 500 votes in one state. Your vote matters. It doesn't matter what state you live in because you're speaking for someone who can't be here today. But friends... Don't stop on November 6th. Being pro-life is not something you do every four years. It's something you do every single day, no matter how old or how young you may be. It's the way you live your life. In addition to electing public officials, we have to be out there providing hope and healing and changing the hearts of our neighbors. 
passing state and national legislation to protect the preborn, their mothers and fathers, from Planned Parenthood and the abortion industry. We have to be there as a church to welcome back our daughters when they call and say, I made a mistake, I'm pregnant. We have to be there in the schools, starting Students for Life groups, educating and helping those most targeted by the abortion industry, this generation. And we also have to be out there in our communities, making abortion unwantable by providing support and tangible resources. Ladies and gentlemen, today is the day that God is calling you. He's calling you to act courageously and to love courageously and to rise up, rise up out of your pews, rise up off your couches, and rise up out of your dorm rooms. Because today, tomorrow, and the next day, babies are scheduled to die. His babies are scheduled to die. Your babies are scheduled to die. And there are mothers and fathers whose heartbreak is certain. And just like how our God sent his only son to earth, so he may die on a cross so that we may have everlasting life. We must begin to live our lives so that others may live. I challenge each of you today, dedicate your short time here on this earth, your life, to something bigger than yourself. Love courageously and be his hands and feet no matter what it costs you. It's our time to abolish abortion. And you survived, and you were chosen. Today, I pledge to defend life always, and I hope you will do the same. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you so much. You know, Kristen, one of, the, one of the things that gives me great hope for America is that I believe America is growing in its understanding of the sanctity of human life, and nowhere is that more evident than with our young people. That's right. This is the first youth generation since the handing down of Roe and Doe in 1973 that's actually pro-life. Most people believe you're pro-abortion, as you get older, you get more pro-life. But that's not the case with this generation and the one behind us because of ultrasound. Thank you. Thank you, Kristen. Kristen Hawkins, thank you so much. Thank you. By the way, pastors that are watching out across America, Kristen mentioned about voter registration. Those that registered for this, you received a voter toolkit, a DVD that has all the information, the downloadable forms that you need to have voter registration in your church. And I encourage you to do that within the next 30 days to register your folks to vote and make sure that they're voting. You know, science and technology has given us a window into the womb, which is helping us see what the scripture tells us in Psalm 139, for you, for you formed me in my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. That's no longer just ink on paper. It's a picture that every mother in America has the opportunity to see. And you know, nearly 80% of mothers who see a picture of their unborn child choose life. There is a reason that Planned Parenthood and the other abortion-centric organizations resist the use of life-affirming technology. It's not Christians who are opposed to science. It's Planned Parenthood and the abortion-centric organizations that don't want mothers to see what God has placed in their womb. But even more important than technology have been the people who use it. The thousands of volunteers across America that are working in the over 200 and, or 2,300 care pregnancy centers that dot the landscape of America that are privately funded in large part by churches and Christians who care for both their babies and for the mothers. And I hope you'll support the care pregnancy centers in your community that are taking a stand for life each and every day. Well, joining me now to lead us in prayer for the fundamental right to life and all that that means for our nation is Shirley Dobson, chairperson of the National Day of Prayer. She joins us by phone from Colorado. Shirley, can you hear me? 
I can, Tony, and it's a privilege to be online with you. Well, thank you so much for joining us this evening and taking time out of your schedule to join us in praying for the issue of life and all that that means to America as we go into one of the most important elections of our lifetime. Absolutely, Tony, and it's a privilege to be able to pray. Thank you. Heavenly Father, we call on your name tonight with one voice. Speaking on behalf of the nation you have raised up and blessed for more than 200 years. Though our sins have been many since the days of our founding, America has never wallowed in such wickedness and debauchery as is occurring today. We have murdered more than 50 million of our babies who were being formed in their mother's wombs. For years, we killed viable and fully informed infants, fully formed infants without anesthetics who were inches from final delivery. How your great heart must grieve for these children whom you know and love. And a few days ago, the platform for one political party proclaimed support for this murderous rampage throughout nine months of pregnancy. It also called for the legalization of same-sex marriage, which subverts the divine plan for families given in the Garden of Eden. Finally, your holy name was expunged and your very existence ignored. But the other political party is not blameless either. It has remained largely silent while their children are deprived of godly teaching in the schools and even the youngest among them are being exposed to homosexual propaganda. Lord, these are but a few of the evils that plague our land, and we are embarrassed and ashamed as we come into your presence. We ask you tonight, in the name of Jesus, to bring about a spiritual renewal that will heal our land and restore righteousness to our people. We deserve judgment, but, O oh God, we ask you to remember mercy. This is our plea, and we thank you for allowing us to fall humbly before you in this moral crisis. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Coming up on iPlit Sunday, Pastor Jim Garlow and Pastor and City Councilman Fernando Cabrera. Did you know an eight-year-old boy couldn't pass out candy at Christmas because they had Jesus printed on the wrapper? A federal appeals court upheld that roadside crosses are unconstitutional. A pastor was ordered to stop holding Bible studies in the privacy of his own home. A nurse was forced to participate in a late-term abortion, even though she had a written agreement that her religious convictions would be honored. A Baton Rouge church was ordered to stop feeding homeless victims of Hurricane Katrina because they offered voluntary prayer and Bible study. The photographer was ordered to pay nearly $7,000 after she declined to photograph a couple's same-sex marriage. Judges have literally turned the original meaning of the First Amendment upside down. Our Constitution protects and celebrates religious liberty. It does not censor or prohibit it. A quote attributed to Patrick Henry states that the Constitution is not an instrument for the government to restrain the people. It is an instrument for the people to restrain the government, lest it come to dominate our lives and our interests. Isn't it time we go back to the Constitution? We have to be vigilant over our government. Uh, government behaves a lot better when they know people are watching. We, the United States, has got to raise up political leaders who will tell us the truth about the difficult decisions we're gonna to have to make. And we're gonna to have to be willing to follow the suggestions and support and elect those people. Religious liberty is gravely threatened in America, the gravest threat it's had since the founding of this republic. Our ability to shape our culture and our future flows from what our founders called our first freedom. How can we stop these kind of abuses? Well, elected representatives write our laws, federal judges appointed by the president rule on those laws. If we want a different future, we must elect men and women who pledge to defend the original intent of the Constitution. If you value freedom and want to preserve that blessing for your children and grandchildren, get informed, 
Go to the polls and vote your values, your biblical values, and make a difference. Please welcome Pastor Jim Carlo. Hi, Tony. Good to be with you at I Pledge Sunday. Let me tell you where we are in our nation right now. It's very simple. If I would have said 10 years ago, marriage is between a man and a woman, you say, well, of course it is. Say that today, Pastor, you're being too political. If I would have said 30 years ago that the practice of homosexuality is not acceptable before God, that is a sin, people said, well, of course it is. Say that today. Oh, Pastor, you're being too political. If I would have said 40 years ago that abortion is wrong, that tearing up a baby in the womb is a bad thing, people would have said, well, of course it is. Say that today, and people will say, oh, Pastor, you're being too political. What we used to call biblical and moral issues is now political. And so pastors aren't supposed to speak out on that anymore. What has happened is we have allowed a moral equivalency to develop between right and left. It's not right versus left. It's right versus wrong. Let me ask you this. Where's the moral compass in America? It should be the pulpit. It should be the pastors. In other words, the pulpit has been largely quiet on this. The reason we have, the problem we have in Washington, D.C., is not merely because of the wayward nature of our Congress. It's because the pulpits of America are not instructing them how they should think with the Word of God. Nor are the pulpits in America adequately instructing people on how the Bible applies to national life to the voting electorate that goes out and selects the 539. Let me ask you a question. How did we get in the mess we're in? I want to talk to you about one day that changed America, July the 2nd, 1954. And what we're dealing with these days, whether it be the issue of abortion or redefinition of marriage or drowning in debt, all these things stem from what happened July the 2nd, 1954. Lyndon Baines Johnson, he was then a senator, was returning from Texas. He'd been in a tough election. He was angry at two prominent businessmen in Texas. They opposed him through secular, not-for-profit corporations. So when Lyndon Baines Johnson got back to Washington, D.C., the IRS was in the process of overhauling the tax code, a bill was going through the Senate, and he stepped up and submitted what is now called the Johnson Amendment. The result was a speech restriction on any 501c3. The chief legislative aide of Lyndon Baines Johnson said, we did not have churches in mind, had no idea it would impact them like this. From that point on, it became effectively illegal for a pastor to speak out in certain ways on the issue of elections. And pulpits went largely silent on biblical application to national issues. For 58 years, there's been attempts to challenge the Johnson Amendment, but it hasn't happened. So consequently, the Alliance Defense Fund, now called the Alliance Defending Freedom, all 2,200 allied attorneys are standing behind us as pastors. If we will intentionally defy that Johnson Amendment and speak out politically on issues from the pulpit, no governmental intrusion in the pulpit based on the First Amendment. 33 pastors started that back in 2008, recorded their sermons, and mailed them in the IRS. And each year, there's been more and more. Over 500 pastors participated last year. This year, join with 1,000 pastors across America by going to pulpitfreedom.org and sign up now. We will not see the spiritual awakening we all long for until the pulpit is unfettered and unmuzzled. Join us at pulpitfreedom.org October the 7th this year. Please welcome Pastor and City Councilman, Fernando Cabrera. Ladies and gentlemen, as you have heard today, we are facing a battle. We are in the middle of a cultural war. We are facing an unprecedented level of religious attacks like never before. Case in point, New York City. The mayor of New York, about a year ago, started to make a move in trying to get churches to be evicted from renting from public schools. Imagine that. Imagine that we have over 10,000 nonprofit organizations 
that could rent from New York City public schools, but one specific group is being targeted. And guess who that is? We're talking about the houses of worship. And back in December of last year, the mayor of New York said, I'm going to give you just but a few weeks. A few weeks. Imagine in New York City trying to find a location to be able to rent. Talking about congregations that represent some of the poorest people in the United States of America, including my councilmatic district, where I'm a city council member. I'm in a councilmatic district where it's the poorest congressional district in the United States. And here comes the Board of Education, who they themselves cannot find properties to have more public schools and have millions of dollars. Let me take that back. Billions of dollars. And now they're telling us, you can't rent from public schools. You're the only ones who can't rent from public schools. Now, we're not asking for a favor. We're asking for fairness. We're talking about renting. We're talking about contributing to our New York City public school system that is in dire need of funding. We're talking about churches that have given of themselves, who have volunteered day in, day out, who are rescuing young people, who are literally being lost in the streets of New York City who are being uh, churches who have given of themselves, who have put themselves in the line to provide adult literacy, to, to help the poor, to help the needy. And we're being told, you're no longer welcome. And I started to ask myself, what is going on? Why, why such a frontal attack towards churches, this unprecedented level of religious attack. And this is not the only one. In 9-11, we were told that pastors and clergy could not participate at the in the 10-year anniversary. We're, we're talking about crisis pregnancy center, religious ones, of course, who the Speaker of the City Council drafted a, a bill to design to shut down all of the crisis pregnancy center in the city of New York. What is going on? Let me tell you what's going on. What, what is going on is that there are special interest groups who are using government right now to become the religion police. What we're talking about here is that we have a small group of people who have positioned themselves uh, to define what worship is, who have positioned themselves to define which religious group should be allowed, for example, in the New York City school to rent. Did you know that uh, uh, the Baha'i faith or a Quaker could rent for New York City schools uh, under the policy that the mayor has? has put far, but a Southern Baptist, hello somebody, <laughs> Assemblies of God, Pentecostal, Presbyterian, Methodists, Lutherans couldn't rent a New York City public school. Now we have the government establishing their own religion and which religion they're going to support. There's something tragically wrong. And there's a deep, deeper issue. The, and the deeper issue is this, that there's a hidden agenda by the special groups uh, who have seen classical historical Christianity. Listen carefully. And I want everybody who's listening by the radio and watching by television to listen carefully. Because I've been told this by the other side that there is a master premeditated plan to stop churches from growing and mobilizing because we are the only ones who are standing in the way. That is the fundamental critical issue facing right now, that we're facing right now. 
And this is why, ladies and gentlemen, this I pledge, uh, this is why Sunday, this is why uh, what we're doing and what we're talking about here today is essential. Now, how are they doing this? Well, what they're doing is they're taking positions of power and influence to redefine and restrict religious freedom. Listen, I, 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 I'm not an alarmist, I, I'm not a sensationalist, I, I consider myself somebody to be reasonable. I'm a college professor, I have my doctorate degree, I work in higher education, I, I'm an elected official, well, maybe that. <laughs> I'm a pastor of a church, I have traveled all over the world, uh, but l- let me tell you what I, I'm trying to tell you here. That there's an urgency, you're hearing it here uh, in in this meeting here today, that those who proclaim to be tolerant, they're tolerant of everybody except those who they don't tolerate. (laughs) And so the goal, (laughs) let me tell you what the ultimate goal is. The ultimate goal is secular humanism to become the religion of the land. And if you don't believe me, talk to the brothers, our brothers and sisters in Europe who are now coming to America and they sound a clarion call because they're telling us we were called, caught off guard. And they're saying, Americans, please wake up. Church of the living God, please listen to this trumpet sound from this man of God. I'm telling you, that is wake up time. It's time for the church to wake up and have an awakening. It's time to rise up and be the church. It's time for the sleeping giant, the sleeping giant to arise and be counted and be bold and be fearless at this hour. So today, I pledge And I pray that you will join with me to pledge to fight for our religious freedom. God bless you. Let's move forward and let's win because we were destined to win. God bless you. I tell you, when I call Fernando on the phone, I, I don't know if I should call him pastor, counselor, city councilman, doctor. He just does so much, and I am so grateful to have him as a friend, and what he is doing in New York City is simply remarkable. Fernando, thank you so much for being with us and all that you do to stand for religious freedom. And I say that because nothing is more fundamental to the success of America than religious freedom. Not the freedom of worship, which is what we're doing here tonight in this church and churches all across America, but the ability to get up tomorrow morning and allow our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ to direct how we live. That is religious freedom. Not the songs we sing but the way we live our lives. And the founding fathers understood this. That that is why the first freedom enumerated in the Bill of Rights is the freedom of religion. You see, the freedom of religion is a protection against big government because first, a nanny state, cradle-to-grave government, is not needed when faith and the fruit of that faith flourishes. And secondly, when a nation looks to an omnipotent God, they will resist big government. That's why we must protect religious freedom in America. Our government, as Abraham Lincoln described, is a government of the people, for the people, and by the people. We decide whether we'll be a nation that acknowledges God, not as an afterthought, but as one in whom we put our trust, or a people who put their trust and then surrender their rights to government. We decide. And how do we decide? We decide by how we vote. Tonight, you have seen and you have heard where our nation stands. You've heard where our nation stands economically. You've heard where we stand morally and where we stand spiritually. 
I think you know that everything that we hold dear, everything that our fathers, forefathers have given to us now hangs in the balance in the year 2012. We, here tonight, gathered in churches all across America, must take responsibility for our future. That's why I'm going to ask you right now to take the pledge. Tonight or tomorrow when you can get back to your computer and go to, what's the website? I pledge to vote.org. Very good. Folks across America, they got it here. I hope you got it there. I pledge to vote.org. And number one, take that pledge, pledge to pray, and join with some of our partnering organizations in praying for the elections. They'll give you prayer points and they'll guide you how to pray every day. Secondly, we can't stop with prayer. Just as Jehoshaphat that I mentioned earlier in 2 Chronicles 20 called upon the Lord when the Lord answered him and told him that the battle was not theirs, but the battle was the Lord's. However, he still required them to prepare for battle and to participate. Be sure that you're registered to vote. And how many of you will commit to registering two friends or family members in the next 30 days? How many can commit to two people, just two? Two friends, two family members, all, hopefully all living, that you can register to vote. <laughs> and then third, take the pledge to vote on election day and then send the I pledge to vote dot org link to your friends post it on your social media sites and let's see if we can't get one million Christians to take the pledge to vote how many will join me in that we have one final speaker one final speaker and then we'll close in prayer but please give your attention to the screen And now a special message from the founder of Samaritan's Purse, Franklin Graham. Thank you, Tony Perkins, and uh, thank you, Mark Harris. You know, our, our nation uh, is in trouble, but I tell you what, there's hope out there. And that hope is in Jesus Christ, uh, God's Son. You see, Jesus Christ can change the human heart. And this is what we're talking about. The heart of man needs to be changed. The heart of America has to be changed. But it starts one heart at a time. And, and we can't do this without God's help. And you see, the whole world is under a death sentence. You see, God says that we've all sinned and come short of God's glory, that the wages of sin is death. That's right. God has placed a death sentence over mankind, but yet God is offering that pardon, and that pardon is through Jesus Christ. And so I want to ask you uh, to pledge your life to Jesus Christ. You see, there is no hope outside of him. We've been talking about you know, the need to change in, in politics and all the problems that we face as a nation, but I can tell you right now, a politician cannot fix the human heart. Only Christ can do that. And I would ask you to pledge your life to Jesus Christ. Put your faith and trust in him. And then pledge to love others. You know what? We need to love other people. We're quick to criticize a person of another political party or we're quick to criticize a person because of the way they look or the length of their hair or whatever it may be. But if we would love one another, just like God loves us, if we're to love other people, and then I encourage you, pledge to pray for our leaders and for this election. Pray for everyone that is seeking the office of president or Congress or state, local level. Pray for the, those leaders and then pray for those that are already in authority over us. Pray for them. And let's see what God will do at this election. We need God's help. We, we desperately need God's help. Our nation's in trouble, but we need God's help. But it begins with your own heart and, and pledging yourself to Christ and trusting him as your Lord and Savior, praying for others, being kind to others, and praying for our nation. God bless you. Well, folks, will you pray? Will you take the pledge to pray? Will you take the pledge to participate? Well, I'm going to ask Dr. Rick Scarborough and Dr. Mark Harris to come as we close in prayer. And I want you to join your hearts with us all across America as we pray for this election, as we pray for 
this nation, and we pray that the church would be salt and light. And I want to lead out, and I'm going to ask Rick to pray, and then Dr. Harris to close us tonight. And I want to thank you all, all across America, for joining us tonight and being a part of I Pledge Sunday. If I didn't think there was, an, there was hope for America, we wouldn't be here tonight. We serve a great God who's just waiting to answer our prayers. Let's pray. Father, we thank you tonight that we gather here in confidence that the prayers that we've offered up have been heard before you. And Father, we understand that it's more than just praying. But we pray as you have instructed us, Lord, when our nation is in shambles, we turn to you and we first, Lord, we seek your face. And we intercede on behalf of this nation, even those who disagree with us. We pray for them that they might come to the freedom of knowing Jesus Christ. And we ask you, Father, to forgive us of our sins and our apathy and our indifference to a nation that has drifted off course. And we ask you to forgive us. And we ask you, Father, to heal our land and to restore us, that we might be a light like a city set upon a hill that would attract others. Let it be so, Lord Jesus. Father, I'm encouraged tonight because there is evidence everywhere we turn that you're moving in this country. Lord, I thank you for Family Research Council, American Family Association, and a hundred other organizations that have all joined heart and hand in an effort to call the nation, the remnant in the country, those who know you, and love you to pray with a concerted effort beginning on September the 28th. Father, we pray that 40 days to save America would be nothing less than that, a 40-day season of prayer and intercession when people from every walk of life, every color of skin, and every denominational background and no background will simply fall before you in an effort to repent of our sin and to release you to heal our land. Father, you told us that if your people who are called by your name would humble themselves and pray and seek your face, you would hear from heaven, forgive our sin and heal our land, and we desperately need a healing. So grant, grant that concerted season of prayer beginning September the 28th to become a reality in Jesus' name. Father, tonight in sanctuaries and in homes all across this nation, we've sought to seek your face truly. Father, we have sought to examine our own hearts and truly to be broken. But Father, we recognize that until we are broken before you, that we can't expect the healing and we can't expect the power that only you can bring. Lord, we pray for our nation's leaders tonight. We pray, God, that you would grant them wisdom. We ask that you would grant them discernment. We ask that you grant them understanding. But, Father, we pray tonight that this sense of unity that we are beginning to, to see and to feel across our nation, the sense of believers coming together, again, from every walk of life, and, Father, coming together to truly, truly cry out to you to sweep across this land how we do seek another great awakening in our lifetime. Awaken the sleeping giant of the church in America today. And, Father, may even tonight, when we look back upon this evening, may this be a time where all across our nation we've heard people saying with voice after voice, I pledge, I pledge, I pledge, I pledge. And Father, may we truly pledge ourselves completely surrender to you. For it's in the name of Jesus, the name that is above every name, that we lift this prayer and all God's people said, Amen, amen, amen and amen. God bless you. Stand with us as the First Baptist Praise Band closes us tonight in a song. Thank you so much for being here.